My name is Jeff Hart and the manager of the CNC Training Academy and I'd like to thank you all for coming here today and indeed the MAC 2016 show. The purpose of this seminar is to show that there are facilities out there and indeed standing in front of you today which will allow us to train for tomorrow. The, and those are the key words, tomorrow and train. Tomorrow has arrived because of the computer revolution. In this show, Mac 2016, over half the machines in this show are fitted with a CNC, computer numerical control. In my early days, if somebody said to me CNC, I'd probably think it was another exam like GCE, GSE, HNC, HND, or STD. Ah, sorry, that was a school exam, not a clinical test. I do apologize. And training. How many people of you here have actually got mobile phones? I suspect 99% of you have got mobile phones, correct? All got mobile phones? So, hands up if you can honestly say that you use 75% of that phone's ability. There isn't many, is there? What about 50%? Is there anybody here who could say you use 50% of the ability? No? I suppose the rest of you probably only use about 25% or less of that phone's ability. All right. In other words, you switch it on, you make a call, you receive a call, and possibly the contact list will have some names and family, friends, numbers in it. But you're not too worried about it because it does a job. So what do we do to explore a little bit more on the phone? Like a lot of parents, we ask our kids to teach us, don't we? We ask kids, what do we do with it, right? Me, I couldn't even trust my kids to get dressed in the morning, let alone ask for a phone now. What about phone school or phone college or phone university? There isn't one, not one at all. No, what we do, we play with them. We change the ringtones, we change the screens, we adjust the time and the date. We set the alarms and if we're really adventurous with the telephone, we connect it to the internet. Or do we do a Chris Tarrant job and we phone a friend and ask them how to do it? Imagine that phone to be a CNC. There's not much difference, except the phone probably doesn't earn you any money. But a CNC can. And if you're only using 50% of that CNC's ability, then it's not earning what it's truly capable of doing. So how do you know you're not using the phone's full capacity? And the answer to that is training. That training will know whether you're using that phone or not. The CNC Training Academy was established in 2010 and currently employs three full-time staff and two part-time members. We are located at the Royal Leamington Spa, emphasis on Royal. Right. We're alongside the Mills CNC Technology Campus. Although we operate independently, we are privileged in being able to use Mills' finest CNC machines. They are fitted with the newest, the fastest CNCs from Fanuc, Heidenhain and Siemens. We have the latest up-to-date tool cutting technology available from the likes of companies like Sandvik, Seiko, Kenner Metal and Horn. There is also tooling equipment. There's new types of work holding methods bar feeders from LNS, FMB, IMCA, tool measuring equipment from Nikon. We get probes from Renishaw and Heidenheim. We've got coordinate measure machines. CAD CAM software from Dell CAM, Feature CAM, Master CAM, etc. Simco software and a host of other related stuff. I think I've got all the companies mentioned, so that's my bottles of Bacardi sorted out for the rest of the Christmas period. All right. If necessary, we can also call on the resource from Mill CNC. They have around 20 service and application engineers that we can utilize if we need to. We can also offer maintenance courses for the electronic side of the controls and also the mechanicals of the machine tools. This will help with alignments and one of the big issues these days is preventative maintenance, stopping avoidable breakdowns. We, the Academy, are proud owners of a vertical machining centre, a three-axis lathe, and uh, some other equipment that we have 
provided to us by our benefactors. But we have a short walk across the campus to the Mills CNC, and there we have access to several four-axis machining centers, five-axis machining centers. We have vertical lays. We have lays from two axes up to nine axis. And we have twin spindles, twin turrets, and we even have a 40 tool changer, B-axis swivel turret lays. The Academy, on its own merit, could never, ever afford this equipment. That's why we work closely with Mills Technology Systems. We can use their equipment, which is the latest up-to-date CNC's. In 2013, we received an award from the MTA, the Machine Tool Association. This award was for the best training organization. To achieve this award, a nationwide internet voting system was used. And to their credit, a lot of the students who attended our courses voted for us that year. It involved going to a wonderful presentation with some food and drink in the center of Birmingham. And just in case you're wondering, I'm the good looking one in between the two thorns there, okay? The one on the left is Charlotte Hawkins from Sky TV, and the one on the left is Karen, and she's one of our training instructors. She's the one with the hair, all right? The bloke on the far right, I know he was important, and he's a very nice man, and he works for the MTA, but I can't honestly remember his name. It was a good night. Just over 30 years ago, I was employed as a training instructor with Fanuc UK, the world's biggest CNC supplier. This involved traveling throughout the whole of Europe, and just in case this referendum doesn't go well at June, I traveled throughout the UK as well. I was training OEMs, original equipment manufacturing suppliers, right through to small SMEs, small to medium enterprises. And I've now personally trained over 6,000 people from around 2,000 different companies. You'd expect me to have a few more gray hairs or be bald by now, but I've been going good. The Training Academy has, over the last five years, around 2,000 students pass through its doors. And the feedback forms filled in at the end of each course by everyone has comments with the vast majority complimenting on the quality and the latest technology used throughout the training. Any negative points are taken note of, mentally logged, and then we throw them in a bin. But I'm only joking. We do take notes, especially if they enhance the training. Attending the courses, we have a wide spectrum of people. We have managing directors, we have time-served old boys, apprentices, change of career, tradesmen and women, and we have overseas visitors as well. These visitors come from South Africa, New Zealand, eastern parts of Europe, India, Egypt, Pakistan, Malaysia, and we've had some from China, Shanghai as well. And they're all looking at the chance to get on board with the new and latest technology. Here are a few comments from the last three months using the feedback forms that we didn't throw away. We had Andrew, a toolmaker from a company called Ancon, said he found the course very extremely useful and factual, was made easy to follow, and came away feeling a lot more able and largely due to the way he had taught. Gordon, who's a process engineer with the company Shivo, he commented, I found the course very worthwhile and interesting, going home with a much more knowledge of the new machine tool and how to set up the first jobs. Alex, a machine oper operator from AD Precision, found the course to be highly valuable. Learned a huge amount of processes and techniques which can now be implemented at work. He also said, very helpful, knowledgeable and a patient trainer. I think, Hannah, that wasn't one of mine, was it? That was one of Karen's, I think. And then we had Dan Smith from GES Hydraulics. Said, excellent course for a beginner. Gives a good understanding of basic turning, drilling, threading and grooving on a lathe. And the last one is one of my favorites. A lovely character called Sean, who is a real diamond, who actually works for a company called Engineering Diamonds Limited. And he said, absolutely great teacher and a super course. He taught an old dog new tricks. And that last comment emphasizes the first thing I said about this morning about the phone. We have to train people for the future. So what are we as an academy trying to do? 
Well, we need to make sure that the UK companies have a way of fixing skill shortages throughout the manufacturing industry. This involves listening to your needs and your requirements and assembling a structured path with a direction for you and your employees to go to. It affects us in every department. We have medical industry with the likes of Stryker, Johnson & Johnson, Corin, Smith & Nephew. We've got oil and gas with GE Oil, NOV, Hughes Armstrong, energy with nuclear, solar, wind farms and other renewable resources. And by the way, I googled wind farms. Who are the manufacturers of wind farms? And according to Wikipedia, which we can trust wholeheartedly, can't we? There are 80 companies worldwide making wind turbine blades. But there's only one company in the UK making these wind turbines. We've got the automotive industry with Jaguar, Land Rover, Fords, Nissan, Honda, Vauxhall, BMW Triumph, and we have the Formula One teams. We've got the Mercedes, Williams, Renault, McLaren, Force India, Red Bull, and those new boys, Haas, they do look the business, don't they? I was quite impressed with them, actually. We've got Triumph, we've got Rally and many others, and then, of course, we've also got the aerospace industry with Airbus, Boeing, Bombardier, Rolls-Royce, and GE Aviation. All these companies are at the high end of technology. Last month, the Academy was invited over to Belfast to give a seminar on the machining of titanium. It was using the facilities of NIAX, Northern Ireland Advanced Composites Engineering. It is housed on the same site as Bombardier, one of the world's leading aircraft manufacturers. Together with Seiko Tools, Mills the Machine Tool Suppliers, WNT the work holding companies, and various other partners such as Siemens, FeatureCam, we gave a four-day theory and hands-on training course. Seiko offered an expert from Sheffield on the characteristics of machining titanium. His name was Rashid. He gave a very informative two-hour combined video and talk show. At the end of the course, each of the ten candidates took home a machined titanium example. They were not all in the best of condition, mind. All right? I don't know about passing the inspection. They even couldn't pass the door, let alone pass the inspection. But some of those, but they all enjoyed it and they loved the experience. The ten candidates were from seven different companies. Five were machining titanium already, and the other two companies wanted to get into the knowledge of machining titanium. They wanted to broaden their market. The subject, machining titanium, was completely out of my comfort zone. But we, the, we used experts in the field of that knowledge to come in and help us, and that's what we were able to do. These skill shortages, are they real or just imagined? Well, in a report by People Strategy, the digital age, globally, that's worldwide, 73% of the 1,300 chief executive officers, officers that were interviewed ranked skill shortages as the biggest threat to their business. That is an increase of 10% from 2014 and a massive 46% increase since 2010. And then in another survey of chief executive officers, this time in the UK, 84% of them are concerned about the negative impact that skill shortages will have on the future of their business. Just over half of Germany's chief executive officers were interviewed, about 54%. They showed a little concern. And then the French chief executive officers. There were only 37% of them that were worried about it. Is it because the French already have plans in place to deal with it? Or are the French just laid back about things anyway? I don't know. Even the government has set out its stall to create a high-skilled economy. But we have firms that are facing a skills emergency now, which threatens to starve our economic growth. Unfortunately, it's those high-growth, high-value sectors and the, with the most potential which are the ones under the most pressure. This includes construction, manufacturing science, engineering and technology. 
Those are not my words, but the words of Katya Hall, the Deputy Director of the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry. And this was reported last week by the Learning and World's Work Institute of Wales. And this was before the presentation was prepared. And the headline was, Education and Training for Adults Crucial in the Wake of the Crisis in the Steel Industry. Now remember, this is just relevant for the Welsh site. I could give you a Welsh accent if you want me to, but I'd prefer it in English. So remember, and remember this is just for the Welsh assembly part. And I quote, the Learning and Work Institute is concerned about the short and long-term prospects for workers in light of the potential mass unemployment that was given here for significant ongoing cuts to education and training in adults in Wales. The Learning and Work Institute believes that in the event of large-scale unemployment, there will be inadequate opportunities for workers to retrain, upskill and broaden their employment through accessing education and training. Last week, statistics were published which showed that there has been a further significant fall in the number of adult learners. A continuous pattern of year-on-year -year decline. The figures published by the Welsh Government show the total number of people studying in the last 10 years dropped to the number of individuals studied to 16,000. That's the loss of 16% in one year. Community-based learning delivered by local authorities also fell by 31%. Last year's budget saw the Welsh Government agree to some additional investment for apprenticeships, but this was not enough to prevent a fall in 12% in work-based learning. The only type of learning to remain steady is full-time learning, the path followed mainly by 16 to 19-year-olds students. My son went to university, two years playing around, and then the third year decided to get together, do his act, and then pass an exam. Those are your full-time students working. Worryingly, these, fe these figures look set to worsen as they are published retrospectively, and so they don't include the current academic year. This, ap this academic year, 2015, has already depleted budget for part-time educations, was cut in half. The Welsh Assembly members must be concerned not only with access to training, but also the support in place to people that have been made redundant. They must find opportunities, not just high quality, but help people overcome barriers brought about by a lack of self-confidence and a perceived lack of employability. The crisis in the steel industry in Wales is a further stark warning to the urgent need of investment in education for adults. That's why the Learning and Work Institute has been calling on the next Welsh Government to have a clear strategy for education, employment and skills, this being at the heart of its government. So those comments beforehand has made it obvious that the skill shortage is a fact. It's not fiction, it's real. If we can improve or even fix that skill shortage, it will help the UK to become more competitive, especially against countries with a lower income employment population, such as China, or Indonesia, etc. It will also help reduce the unemployment rate. That fell by 102,000 to 1.86 million in the three months leading up to the end of January. This is according to the Office of National Certificates. Statistics. The number of people claiming job seekers allowance in February fell by 31,000 to 791,000, which happens to be its lowest level since 2008. The employment rate, not the unemployment rate, now stands at 73%. That's the highest rate of people in work since the Office for National Statistics began keeping records in 1971. So it's not all doom and gloom. If we fix the skill shortage, it will offer opportunities to lead the way in growing high value sectors for manufacturing. Then we will have more income for the UK companies, which mean more revenue for the government. That includes my pension, by the way. So I want my pension still up there when you lot start working, all right? And social cohesion. I was brought up in South Wales. And when the coal mines and the Ebervale steelworks shut down, it was awful. Whole communities were wiped out because it affects everyone in the area. 
You get the shops going down, the banks, the garages, the fast food outlets, all of those, they go down. And if you couple that together with crime, ill health, and despondency on the increase, you can see why the Port Talbot and other steel industries' closures and potential closures does worry me. Skill shortages has a distinct impact on company level as well. They become uncompetitive and unable to quote keen prices. They miss the opportunity to do the job because nobody in the company is able to design the component, price the component, even competent or even qualified to make the component, or maybe the workload is just too great. And then you find the company stagnating. As in that well-known saying by Henry Ford, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And it's a vicious circle. It builds frustration amongst the customers and employees. And if the company is recruiting, it doesn't take an unemployed rocket scientist to see that that company is not at the forefront of technology. The government response, although making the right noises, it does have some issues. Apprentices can be three to five years long, which is very, very time consuming. And unfortunately, that doesn't help you today's age. Full-time college, university, one year is normally full-time again. And then, do the schools, colleges and universities, do they have the latest technology? In some respects they do, but it quickly becomes outdated. And after a huge investment with CNC machines or a software package, it becomes exactly outdated, just like your mobile phone does. So funding for new equipment can be very dis difficult to justify. I recently did some training on CNC milling purchased by a college of further education up in the northeast. I was amazed at how little the workshop had changed in 40 years. The reliable Bridgeport and Matchmaker machines were still there. There were Universal Millers, sorry, there were Adcock and Shipley horizontal slab millers still there. There were the Jones and Shipman surface grinders and cylindrical grinders still there. And do you remember those bloody awful shaping machines? Remember them? Right? Where a bit of high-speed steel clamped to the front, chipping those big red-hot metals and all the students ducking out the way of them? They were still there on the shop floor in the, in the, training, in the training room. So you couldn't take a big cut with them, could you? You could stall it, by the way. And then what about the course content? Do we need to spend three weeks training people how to grind a high-speed steel drill? We don't. What about filing a piece of f steel flat so that you put your straight edge on it and looked underneath to see any daylight? Do we need to do that now? We don't. Those days have gone. Or, what I prefer is we get the experts and the professional in to teach them the latest tool technology from tool suppliers. I was taught in my day, in my school days, to work out the square root of a number in longhand. Later, we had logarithm books. But now, we have calculators with a calculator on it, which has got one of those, right? It's got a little square root on it. And by the way, those 25% of you with the phones, if you hold your calculator vertical, you get a standard one. If you tilt it horizontal, you get a scientific calculator, right? That's your technology going there straight away. All right? I should have gone to phone school, shouldn't I? Much easier. So, we have a couple of propositions for you, what we think is the way to go forward. We think we should offer short and sharper, but more often, these courses. So we think a shorter three to eight, going? Shall we go and see Mark Webber? <laughs> Later. Right. Proposition number one, we think a shorter three to five day course which targets a specific type of machine or control is much more beneficial. Courses with a specific discipline, not a whole range of things to get their heads around. We do modular courses. 
they seem to work really well. Students or employees come in and out of training at certain points and then they pick up at a later date to suit companies and employees' timescales. Things like holidays, shift work, sickness. We have experts in their field to train and divulge the knowledge, especially in tooling and materials and maintenance courses. This can and often does show immediate return of investment after a few days. The second proposition is retraining or upskilling personnel already employed by yourselves. For example, if you have a technical drawing person, the next step could be to Im improve him up to a CAD CAM drawing or a modeling artist. There he can prepare programs to be sent down to your machine shop. Maybe you have an electrician who is putting plugs and sockets around. Upgrade to an electronics engineer able to check out the diagnostics on a CNC control. Replace proximity switches. Do keep relays, thus enabling the machine to keep running and still have time for your plugs and sockets around the factory. We then have welders and fabricators. If you can add another skill to him or her and program some robots to do the jobs. If you've seen the robot welders, they are fantastic. And paint sprayers. They've got the knack. You've seen the sprayers, the way they do it. They actually can teach robots now to paint spray. So they get a copy in man, they get a paint gun on the end of it, they spray the car or whatever they're spraying, the robot copies them exactly the way they're actually doing. It's fantastic to watch. But the robot still doesn't hang his clothes up on the floor, so they still can't do with us men. We've got general laborers. They're invaluable, aren't they? If they want it, then give them the chance or another interest to show them how to load CNC bars in. Check the coolant level. Check the quality of the coolant level. Upgrade these guys. Get them to more interested in their work. They're little things, but you do get big rewards from them. So what do we actually get from training? We get machines used at their full potential. Using the figures from 2015, Jaguar Land Rover sold over 425,000 cars last year. Now each of those cars hopefully had an engine in them. All right? And those engines ranged from four to eight cylinders. I'm going to take an average of six cylinders for each engine with six pistons. So anybody doing the maths on their phone now? So that is around two and a half million pistons last year for the Jaguar Land Rover. Now a lot of components are actually assembled to make these pistons. But if we just take the connecting rod and we have to machine the two bores in it, then if it's possible to reduce one second off each of those bores, that would reduce the production time by 1,400 hours over the year. Just one second off each bore. You lose 1,400 hours work. And that, at 30 pound an hour, would make a saving of 42 and a half grand. Now that would save you one employee, or you could hire me twice. All right? So that's how much money you know we're on now. So that's just a saving of one second per one hole on one component. So that's why it's important that you do get your guys up to speed with the latest technology on there. A company that has subcontracted work out. I've had personal cases where operators and program didn't realize that the machine they were using could do certain operations. And the blank look on their faces when you say, when they say to you, well, why do we send these jobs out then? It's great. It's pleasing to me. It's also a little bit smug because I know then we've done our job and these guys are happy. We get complicated and complex work done in-house. I have a case study later which will highlight this. Inspection and quality of work improves. We can have probes fitted onto the machine that can do several things such as measure a component before removing work holding. The size is correct, then we can offset the automatic offsets automatically for you. We can measure it, find it's not right, find out what the difference is, that value will be updated and the machine can carry on production. We can have probes to see if a tool is broken or is worn out. It's handy in tool life management. A replacement sister tool can be brought in and the continuation of production especially in a lights-out, non-man production environment, can be done. On the same lines, most CNC's can now monitor the tool load. So if the tool load becomes too great, it can either 
stop the machine or give us another sister tooling to call out to replace this operation. Oh, sorry, my apologies. We've got tool setting gauges. To shorten downtime on the machine, it's possible to measure the tool's length and diameter prior to fitting on this machine. Therefore, a program in the machine will automatically input the sizes into the offset table and the operator setter can get on with his job a lot quicker. We've got Sandvik, Seiko and other tooling manufacturers offer modular tooling. That is a tool which can be set up, replaced or reused and is guaranteed to go back at the same place and repeat within microns. Capto tooling is an example of this. We know all the sizes of the Capto tooling. The programmer knows them, puts them into his program, the program loads in, all these sizes are actually automatically done. We have tool setting arms, and they're quite popular on laser machining centers, but often the operator uh, has a little bump on them through a little bit of carelessness. We can show people how to recalibrate these and reset these as well. All those, item, all those items, we can do the training for you. What about the employee? They normally feel, the employee normally feels better for his or her self-esteem. The loyalty of the employee stay at the same workplace because the interest is kept high. And it keeps not, it's not mind-numbing to him. The right training has been given to operate the machine. This allows your health and safety to be up to date. Awareness of hazards to look out for when operating the machine. Avoid the machine crashes, reducing the downtime of the machine. Avoid poor quality of work. Then you can offer a risk assessment. Has that been done? And is the operator capable of doing that? We get environmental awareness, such as swarf management, disposable hazardous waste, machining certain materials, such as magnesium, titanium or depleted uranium. Those materials carry a huge fire risk. Is the operator aware of that? Does he know what to do in the event of a fire breaking out? Has the machine got its own fire extinguishers? Should it have one? If it goes off accidentally, do they get the vacuum cleaner and clean it all out? All of these can be answered with the correct training from the correct sources. Then you have your health and safety requirements. They will also be met. Improved work methods, saving time and money. One of the main things we have picked up on our, from our engineers is they still like to use the old tried and tested machining methods. And that, with today's technology for increased cutting speeds of material and better tooling, is just not acceptable. So we teach people about constant surface speeds, where to find the values, how to calculate the speeds out, and the feed rate, how it affects surface finish and tool life, thus improving costs and reducing wastage. And then, something close to your heart, is the managing director, the purchasing director or the buyer, qualified to make the decision on buying the right machine? Does he or she go down to the shop floor and ask the machinist or the operators what they want or to improve production on start production machining new components? And then, is that person he's asking, is he qualified enough and up to date enough to give an informative answer? It's also handy for the employer to keep an audit of personal training for the future. Then you can conform to ISO standards as well. It also helps in making and recruiting negotiations at a, f at a later date. We have a couple of case studies here. And the first one was a company based in Worcester. The company relied entirely on offline programming. That meant if the two programmers were, out, were off outside the normal working area, the, the machinists were unable to machine new fixtures or jaws because they didn't know how to operate or program the machine. So therefore, we did a quick three-day course for the operators and the programmers to machine the jaws and fixtures. We used the NC and a conversational system to make things easier for them. This made the machine available for a full 24 hours now. With the use of templates and standard formats, when we agreed that, the operator could then go on and machine stuff continuously. The second case study was a Lincoln-based company owned by a chemist. He used to import bicycle parts from China and then resell them on throughout the UK using the internet. On closer inspection, 
the manager, who was also a very keen bicycle fan, found out that these parts which he imported could be machined on a lathe. He therefore bought a small four-axis lathe. It had two spindles, a C-axis and a Y-axis. And then one by one, he sent his employees, which were originally his packing team, he sent them to us for training. He now has a thriving business manufacturing bike parts. And these bike parts are now cheaper and of higher quality than his Chinese counterparts. He's now taken delivery of three CNC machines to continue this production. The third case study has come quite nicely. And the guy actually, unbeknown to me, has just turned up on the front here. It was a company located in the southwest, Marshall Sea Hydraulics. They used to subcontract out the work because it was difficult to produce in-house. At that time, they were struggling financially. But luckily, they had a young lad. He was young in them days, right? They had a young lad who managed to convince them to invest in some new technology. They purchased a nine-axis lathe. It was fitted with a twin spindle, twin turrets, and one of the turrets was able to swivel and tool change. Before, they used to have nine operations to produce this component in-house. So that's nine separate operations on nine different machines. Now, all those operations are produced on one machine for him and saving the quality and saving the time for that. The subcontractor, who was previously charged £120 each for each of those components, now makes them in-house for around £50 each. So he saved a lot of money by bringing the money work in-house. Training high-tech machines has, and the abilities has proved to be the company's lifeline. They now have three lots of these machines producing these parts. I believe you're after another one. Four, is it now? See? Can't even keep up with the times. They've got four now. And you're after another one soon as well. So, where do we go from here? Well, hopefully, you can see there are good reasons for training. So, if you need some help and advice on training, please come to us. Would you like us to arrange some in-house assessment of staff personnel? Do you have the facilities for training? Do you have the people that need to pass that training on? We can provide certification for you as a training as well. And we can also arrange a system where the results can be monitored for improvements for a projected course future. Where, which direction do you want to go? We also have the facility of bringing the Training Academy to you. The Training Academy has six mobile touchscreen PCs. These are fitted with simulation software packages from the likes of Fanuc, Heidenhein, Siemens, and we have other software such as FeatureCam and Simco. Quite often due to logistical issues, we have been asked to go to companies on site and prepare to carry out the training for them. And so long as the working environment is correct, in other words, it's clean, quiet, non-interruptive, lots of coffee and tea, then this can be productive. As it decreases costs for hotels, employees over time and travelling costs. Anyway, we are now coming to a close, thankfully, it was a big sigh. I don't actually know what your individual requirements are, but please feel free to come and see me after this seminar and I'll be only too pleased to help you. I have a stand on the Academy, it's in Hall 5, located in 5430. If you want to come there, I'll only be too pleased to see you there as well. And I know you're busy, but Hannah at the back there, she would love to take your, scan you in and give you some more details or make an appointment for us to come and see you should you require it. I'd like to thank you for your patience today and to see you all here in the MAC 2018 show. Thank you very much. All right.